This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 928, recorded on August 18th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. But but Vincent, I'm I'm not in New York. I'm actually in uh, Glasgow. <laughs> I'm in. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in Christina. I'm such a creature of habit <laughs> that I always say New York. But yes, from Glasgow, Daniel Griffin. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you, Daniel. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's uh, I, I had to come down here because apparently the internet in Edinburgh is not as quick as I would like. So. Um, and I'll start off with a very uh, Scottish quotation from David Hume uh, from his An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. In our reasonings concerning matter of fact, there are all imaginable degrees of assurance from the highest certainty to the lowest species of moral evidence. A wise man, therefore, proportions his belief to the evidence. So. I think we're holding uh, humanity to a too high standard, Daniel. <laughs> it's just not working. <laughs> that might be true, but this is my hope: is that you know I, I think we we actually do the opposite. Like the less certain, the more um, vehement, the the more emotion we bring to a topic, and then when it's finally very clear cut, we're like, all right, whatever. That's the way it is. And it really should be the opposite. When we don't know, we should be humble and just say, you know, we're, we're not sure. We're learning. There's questions out there. This is what we know so far. Um, we just we love that that quick, simple solution to our problems. So, all right. But let us start with the MMWR, uh, public health response to a case of paralytic poliomyelitis in an unvaccinated person and detection of polio virus in wastewater, New York, June, dash August 20. 22. Um, and, and I'm going to pull Vincent. We, we're going to do polio. We're going to do monkeypox. We're going to do be COVID. We got a lot going here. So um, I will start with a little background here. Um, this report uh, from the MMWR or in the MMWR describes the recent case of paralytic polio reported to the CDC. So that is the disease, polio is the disease and the paralytic manifestation. The last US case of polio caused by wild polio virus occurred in 1979 and the WHO region of the Americas was declared polio free in 1994. So this report, I encourage people to read it, it's very short, uh, but it describes the second identification of community transmission of polio virus in the United States since 1979. Uh, the previous instance in 2005 uh, was, they say, a vaccine-derived polio virus type 1. In June 2022, a young adult with a five-day history of low-grade fever, neck stiffness, back and abdominal pain, constipation, and five days of bilateral lower extremity weakness visited an emergency department and was subsequently hospitalized with suspected acute flaccid myelitis, AFM. Um, and some of our listeners may know that this can be caused by a number of other viral illnesses. Um, in this case, this patient was unvaccinated against polio. And as part of the national AFM surveillance, the suspected case was reported. Sequencing of a stool specimen identified polio virus type 2. And I'm going to say this is where it gets interesting, if it wasn't interesting enough. Based on the typical incubation period for paralytic polio, the presumed period of exposure occurred 7 to 21 days before the onset of paralysis. Epidemiological investigation revealed that the patient attended a large gathering um, just eight days before symptom onset, had not traveled internationally during the presumed exposure period. Um, and, and this is something I want to point out. Um, and I think this is a fact that many, there are many experts all of a sudden, um, but these experts seem to miss um, is that the rate of paralysis for type two is different than for type one polio. Type one, it's about one in 200. Type two is different, uh, approximately I'm going to say I'm going to round up to one in 2,000 for polio virus type 2 infections among unvaccinated persons resulting in paralysis. So for every case of paralysis, um, we might estimate about 2,000 cases in unvaccinated people, um, perhaps more in vaccinated people. So Vincent, I thought I'd pull you in on these sort of calculations. 
Yeah, so the type 2 is is quite different from type 1 and 3 and the the problem here is that in the US we use inactivated polio vaccine and our intestines are not resistant to infection by any circulating polio virus. So if you are vaccinated, you're not going to contract polio, but the virus can reproduce in you. And that's why it's in the wastewater in this particular area. It's most likely in wastewater in many other parts of the US. And so you need to be vaccinated. These are mostly type two vaccine derived polio viruses. They, they transmit very well after being excreted uh, from people who get the type two OPV, which we don't, again, we don't use in this country. And, you know, this community has very low polio vaccination rates for unfathomable reasons. And as a consequence, uh, th th we have a case of polio. And I would not be surprised if we saw more cases in the coming weeks. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, you know, we, we complained about COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 and why two different things. But I think here you see the confusion. Is it polio virus? Is it polio infection? Is it polio disease? Yeah. Um, my wife even made this comment like, you know, is, is paralysis binary? If you, if you get, you know, paralysis, are you on an iron lung? Can you have just some sort of residual weakness? Can you have a post-polio syndrome? That oh, yeah. Doesn't, yeah. No, no, no. You can have a whole range of paralytic disease from mild limb weakness to respiratory failure requiring an iron lung. Yeah. So yeah. it's a quite a long range. And and people with mild paralysis can be rehabilitated and recover limb function, but uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So you might as well get vaccinated. That's this very clear solution in this case. Yeah. I'm going to just echo that. The answer is simple. Get vaccinated, get your kids vaccinated, encourage your friends and enemies to get vaccinated. And for clinicians, <laughs> never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Um, and as we also may have heard, um, not only has um, has polio been detected um, in Rockland, in Orange County, but now in New York City wastewater. Um, and we've been, you know, we, I, I'm going to give you a little bit more credit, but a number of us have been suggesting that if wastewater monitoring occurred, if the public was aware that polio was here and circulating, that would help with our vaccine efforts. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people have this idea that polio is gone. Polio virus is not gone. In the U.S., we up until now, we didn't have paralytic disease, so the disease polio was gone. But the virus will continue to circulate because in most parts of the world, they are using OPV, oral polio vaccine, which is shed. And this is a real problem for eradication, Daniel. I don't know how we're going to eradicate. Uh, we've, we've replaced wild polio viruses, essentially, with vaccine-derived polio viruses. And now we're stuck because we keep using the vaccine. <laughs> and so the, the virus continues to circulate. And if you don't stay vaccinated, you might get polio. So I'm worried about the er eradication effort now, Daniel. Yeah. Well, hopefully in future deep dives, maybe we'll discuss about some new approaches to vaccination that might help right. us here. So there are some, yes. Yeah. So, all right, stay tuned. Monkeypox update. And as I like to say right up front, monkeypox is not a gay disease or an African disease. Monkeypox is an infectious disease. Um, and I've sort of tried to point out from the beginning that though this initially was introduced into um, the men who have sex with men population, it, it's by no way a disease that will stay limited to that. We've already seen that beyond. Um, and so as we know, well over 2,000 cases just right here in New York City, over 12,000 cases in the US, the, the numbers keep climbing. And we did actually, we heard about new new virus variants, new names. So we're, we're getting a little bit um, of some movement here. We heard from the WHO that consensus was reached to now refer to the former Congo Basin, Central African clade as clade one, and the former West African clade as clade two. Um, additionally, it was agreed that the clade two consists of two subclades, and then they go on. I mean, I think we're all used to uh, naming conventions by now. The proper naming structure will be represented by a Roman numeral for the clade and a lowercase alphanumeric character for the subclades. Um, I have to say, it's going to take me a little while, actually. Um, I think maybe we should start thinking about renaming before we're in the midst of a problem. 
Um, transmission, let's move on to transmission. I have a couple interesting things here. Um, one was the correspondence, evidence of human to dog transmission of monkeypox published in The Lancet. Now people know for me, this hits close to home. I kept seeing you know, these, these tweets and these pictures of, uh, of our current president hanging out with his dog commander while he had the COVID. And, you know, think about your pets. Well, here we hear of two men from Paris, France, who owned an Italian greyhound. And, the, and the, these two men were diagnosed with the monkeypox. Um, one man referred to as patient one, a uh, Latino, aged 44, living with HIV with undetectable viral loads on antiretrovirals. Uh, the second man, patient two, white, uh, non-Hispanic, aged 27 years, HIV negative. In patient one, virus was detected in the sk skin and oropharynx samples, whereas in patient two, virus was detected in anal and oropharyngeal samples. Um, 12 days after symptom onset, for the first individual, uh, symptom onset was very similar for these two men, their male Italian greyhound, aged four years and with no previous medical disorders, presented with mucocutaneous lesions, including abdominal pustules and a thin anal ulceration. The dog tested positive for monkeypox virus by PCR. Um, the monkeypox virus DNA sequences from the dog and patient one were compared by next generation sequencing and the virus that infected patient one and the virus that infected the dog showed 100% sequence, sequence homology. Um, the men reported co-sleeping with their dog. They have been careful to prevent their dog from contact with other pets or humans from the onset of their own symptoms. So we think this is going to kind of stop here. A uh, little bit of a warning that the uh, monkeypox can go um, from humans to their canine companions. We also have the disturbing MMWR early release, human monkeypox without viral prodrome or sexual exposure, California, USA, 2022. Now, this, this made me think of uh, Rich Condon on the last TWIV, suggesting if we only change behavior, it would all be better. Well, I'm not sure how optimistic I am after uh, this and um, some very similar cases that I have seen um, so far myself but this is another case where there was no obvious exposure, no obvious um, behavior that we had previously thought was associated. So this is a man in his 20s. He sought care at an emergency department in Stanford, California, USA, on day seven of an asynchronous, I think that's important, diffuse vesicular rash. So these were not all in the same stages of development, but in different stages of development after he had traveled to the United Kingdom I hope he wasn't up here in Scotland. The first lesion appeared about 14 days after he attended a large crowded outdoor event at which he had close contact with others, included close dancing for a few hours. He said that many attendees were in sleeveless tops and shorts. He wore pants and short sleeve top. He did not notice any skin lesions on anyone present. Not sure how well you can see that at such a venue, but the patient was ultimately diagnosed with the monkey box. Um, this patient did not report recent sexual contact, did not have evidence of genital lesions or inguinal swelling of the lymph nodes. He did not have a violent vi viral prodrome. His primary risk factor was close non-sexual contact with numerous unknown persons at a crowded outdoor event. Um, so I think, I think this is still in line with what we talk about, but it really makes it clear this does not require sexual transmission. This does not require that you're in any particular target group. Um, and uh, I'll sort of leave that there as we move on to testing. Um, remember, the, keep getting uh, emails about this. Remember to make the diagnosis, you have to do the test and send off those swabs in transport media and keep them refrigerated or frozen after collection. Um, and as I like to say, remember Occam was not a physician, John Hickam was. A patient can have as many diagnoses as they please. So uh, cotton swab, non-cotton swab, a uh, couple of those for the monkeypox DNA, maybe a couple swabs if you're looking for the herpes um, and the varicella zoster, and you may even think about looking for MRSA. So, so approach this as a clinician. Um, and as far as vaccines, we got them. 
Um, and I'm going to encourage people to listen to TWIV 927, Merchlinsky versus Monkeypox. I actually thought that was a great um, episode. So we have vaccines. They're smallpox vaccines. Um, we have a certain confidence um, about their ability to help us with the smallpox. And we're hearing really encouraging things about different ways of administering them um, and also hopefully about increasing supplies as we go forward. So clinical course and treatment. Um, I like to say observation in most cases, um, but in some cases we may be using the TPOX or the viroptic eye drops. So the perspective Teco Viramat and the treatment of monkeypox, past, present, future considerations was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I actually thought that this was a nice um, overview. Uh, the authors start by explaining that Teco Viramat is an antiviral drug that was approved for the treatment of smallpox under a regulation known as the animal rule. Um, this pathway allows for approval of drugs for serious or life-threatening conditions when it is not ethical to conduct efficacy studies in humans and not feasible to conduct field studies to study the effectiveness of a drug or a biological product. Um, now, Tecavirabat's efficacy for the treatment of smallpox was established, and the drug was approved on the basis of studies in animal models using related orthopox viruses. So specifically, non-human primates infected with monkeypox virus and rabbits infected with rabbitpox virus. Oh my gosh. In these studies, survival rates were markedly higher among animals that received tecovirumat than among those that received placebo. Um, safety in humans was evaluated by looking for adverse reactions in healthy volunteers. So we have the safety data there. Um, and what they did is they actually made the recommendations about the dose um, based upon plasma concentrations in healthy volunteers, um, comparing these to what was required to protect the animals. Um, and then the duration also sort of is extrapolated from here. Um, but just to let everyone know, um, there is a plan to go ahead um, and do a trial. This trial will be conducted by the AIDS Clinical Trials Group. Um, and this is going to actually assess the safety and efficacy of tecovirumab for the treatment of monkeypox disease. And a trial is coming soon to an academic facility near you, actually Columbia University will be um, firing up pretty soon. So I'll keep our listeners posted and actually maybe share some links, um, hopefully get people to help us move science forward. All right, the brief communication, retrospective detection of asymptomatic monkeypox virus infections among male sexual health clinic attendees in Belgium was published in Nature Medicine. Now here the authors point out that we do not know, that's okay in science, there are things we do not know but wanna learn, but we do not know whether asymptomatic or otherwise undiagnosed infections are fueling this current spread of the monkeypox, right? So I know a lot of people are saying, oh, you can't spread this unless you have active lesions. Well, we do not know that. That's what we think. Now they set out to assess whether undiagnosed infections occurred among men attending a Belgian sexual health clinic in May, 2022. They retrospectively screened over 200 samples that have been collected for gonorrhea and chlamydia testing using a monkeypox virus PCR assay, and they identified the monkeypox DNA from four of the men. At the time of sampling, one man did have a painful rash, so perhaps that was uh, the monkeypox, but three men reported no symptoms. Uh, they followed these folks out, and upon clinical exam 21 to 37 days later, these three men were free of clinical signs, and they reported not having experienced any symptoms. Now, serology did confirm uh, the monkeypox virus exposure in all three men, and monkeypox virus was cultured from two cases. So I will agree, these findings show that certain cases of monkeypox remain undiagnosed. Um, I do not know if these individuals are able to transmit to others, these asymptomatic. Um, I think we've really hammered home just because you could culture that virus does not mean there's enough virus to transmit um, to someone else. So it's important as we move forward, but we should move forward honestly. All right, I noticed Vincent was nodding there. I think he approves. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Even though in this, now we do get infectious virus here because this can be cultured under BSL-2 conditions. You don't need a special lab to do cell culture isolation of monkeypox. But uh, even though we find infectious virus, we don't know, as you say, if it's enough to transmit. That's a very important finding and I'm sure they'll do the experiments to find out. 
Excellent. Well, it seems like we're starting in the right direction there. And back to COVID. Now, the CDC updated its what to do if you were exposed to COVID-19 and its isolation and precautions for people with COVID-19. Um, and they're getting beat up. That's, that's what happens. Um, the update recommends that after being exposed to COVID-19, one should take precautions. Wear a high quality mask, respirator. Anytime you're around others inside your home or indoors in public, do not go places where you're unable to wear a mask, including travel and public transportation settings. Take extra precautions if you'll be around people who are likely to get very sick and watch for symptoms. If you get symptoms, you go ahead and test. If you don't get symptoms, you test on day five. Quarantine for the unvaccinated is gone. It's the same level playing field for everyone. Some people are not happy about that. Isolation for the infected. If you test positive for COVID-19, stay home for at least five days, isolate from others in your home, and they actually say something we've been saying for quite a while, you are likely most infectious during those first five days. After you end isolation, when you are feeling better, wear your mask through day 10. So take the precaution remains in effect. But then we get a little more on this test out after the day five, after the five day isolations. And here they say, if you have access to antigen tests, you should consider using them with two sequential negative tests, 48 hours apart. So think about that. Day six, day eight, you may remove your mask sooner than day 10. I'm almost at day 10. If your antigen tests are positive, you may still be infectious. I like the word may you should continue wearing a mask and wait at least 40 hours before taking another test. Continue taking antigen tests at least 48 hours apart until you have two sequential negative results. This may mean that you need to continue wearing a mask and testing beyond day 10. Um, now, after you have ended isolation, if your COVID-19 symptoms recur or worsen, they recommend restarting your isolation at day zero. All right. So, Daniel, I want to go back to a question I asked you weeks ago. Yes. How long are we going to do this? <laughs> this virus is not going away, right? It's not disappearing. It's always going to circulate. So are we going to always hold to these kinds of rules? or, or what? I, we, we don't know the answer to that, but I bring it up to question why we're doing it, because if if there's a good reason to do it, then that will stay in place forever, essentially. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things. Like, if nothing is going to change, why would we do something different a year from now than we're doing right now? And I'm not sure something's going to change. Um, you know, it is true. Not in a year. Yeah. No. I mean, <laughs> we're kind of there. Yeah. No, COVID's here. Um, you know, interesting enough, we, were at, we are at a point right now where 450 people on average are still dying a day. Um, those are mostly the unvaccinated. If they are older individuals, they have not been offered Evusheld. They haven't had access to early treatment. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure that, you know, we, we really are getting to the point. I mean, here in Scotland, I was I was talking to Christine, I was saying it really pretty much appears like COVID is over. Um, and in many ways, um, I think we need to just to look at, um, is this sustainable? Do we want this to be sustainable? Um, yeah, I know the, the CDC is being beaten up, um, but I'm not sure they should be beaten up. There's a certain reality when um, you've been offered all the all the tools um, and at some point you've got to decide what you're going to do going forward i think we lost all our listeners right then vincent anyway <laughs> children COVID, and vulnerable populations um, as i've been saying for a while children are at risk for COVID. we still have a lot to learn about COVID and kids um, and remember there are certain children that are at higher risk where we may not just want to uh, cross our fingers and see how they do. Um, and so there are active studies. We're going to talking a bunch about Paxlovid today. Uh, active studies on Paxlovid in the pediatric population. There's one I'm going to promote here, Columbia, the kidscovidstudy.org. Um, and they're looking for children with COVID-19 symptom onset within five days of study enrollment um, who have at least one medical condition that would put them at high risk. So that could be obesity, kidney disease, sickle cell, chronic lung, cardiovascular, um, et cetera. So um, encourage, you know, we, we still continue to need to do the research. So um, for some of the kids, yeah, things may change as we go forward. All right. Pre-exposure, transmission, testing. Um, 
use tests intelligently. And remember, there's more out there than just COVID. Um, and remember, remember masks and ventilation, um, particularly as we're headed here into um, the reopening of schools. They actually just opened uh, Wednesday here in Scotland. Um, <clears throat> the article, Risk of SARS-CoV-2 Acquisition in Healthcare Workers According to Cumulative Patient Exposure and Preferred Mask Tape. So a little shock here, you're going to find out that masks actually work. In this study of 2,919 healthcare workers, they reported that SARS-CoV-2 positivity in healthcare workers was associated with cumulative COVID-19 patient exposure, right? So the more you're exposed, the more likely you are. And if you go ahead and wear one of these respirators, uh, they saw a reduction of about 40%, um, even when you sort of adjusted for all the other issues. So sort of interesting. Interesting, right? You're, you're comparing this to wearing surgical masks. Um, and also, I think what makes sense is the more exposure, the more your risk. Um, and this is as our schools open again. Um, we've had quite a bit of time to improve the filtration, improve the air quality. That's not just about COVID. It's going to help us with a lot of pathogens. Effectiveness of HEPA filters at removing infectious SARS-CoV-2 from the air was published in M-Sphere, an ASM journal. I'm not that familiar with M-Sphere, but here the authors wanted to evaluate the removal effect of HEPA filtration on airborne SARS-CoV-2. So they chose to uh, disseminate infectious SARS-CoV-2 aerosols in a test chamber in a biosafety level three facility. And then they filtered the air with a HEPA filtered air cleaner in the chamber. They found that the air cleaner with the HEPA filter continuously removed the infectious SARS-CoV-2 from the air in a running time dependent manner. And the virus capture ratios were 85, 96, and 99.97 at one, two, and 7.1 ventilation volumes. Those are chamber volumes. Actually, I spent a little time trying to understand this, uh, these units. Um, but actually, it looks like you can filter the air with the HEPA filters. All right, active vaccination. Updated boosters for the fall, details to follow, but new this week, Novavax seeks US authorization for COVID vaccine booster. This makes a lot of sense, and we talked about the science on this. There's a number of folks out there who maybe got one or two of those mRNA shots. They're a little bit hesitant. Maybe they got a J&J. &J. Dare I mention them on this show? Um, and they're looking at moving forward with another shot. And so here's the uh, potential for Novavax to be that next shot that they get. Uh, passive vaccination. I keep touting the EVU shield. Let's keep this EVU shield and not turn this into EVU shelf. Um, and now I'm going to move into what I promised, the early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase. So this is that first week you've been diagnosed. We say number one is Paxlovid, but what about Paxlovid if you've been vaccinated? Does that work? So let me just mention a few of the um, bits of information we have. So I will start with the Pfizer reports additional data on Paxlovid supporting upcoming new drug application submission to US FDA. And here we get the report of a subgroup analysis from Pfizer of a non-significant 57% reduction. See, non-significant 57% reduction in hospitalizations and death observed in Paxlovid treated vaccinated patients with at least one risk factor for severe COVID-19. So not particularly overwhelming start. Um, now we did discuss the MMWR, Hospitalization and Emergency Department Encounters for COVID-19 After Paxlovid Treatment, California, December 2021-May 2022. Now this was that study where electronic health record data from Kaiser Permanente Southern California um, was used to describe hospital admissions and emergency department encounters related to SARS-CoV-2 infections during the five to 15 days after pharmacy dispensation of a five-day course of Paxlovid. Among the persons who received Paxlovid during December 31, 2021 through May 26, 2022, 
only 8% were unvaccinated. So this is a real world experience with vaccinated individuals getting Paxlovid. And they reported that less than 1% of all patients who received Paxlovid during the study period ended up with hospitalizations or ED encounters for COVID-19 related illnesses. So a little bit tough how much of that was due to Paxlovid. Um, and we also have the article Effectiveness of Paxlovid in Reducing Severe COVID-19 and Mortality in High-Risk Patients published in CID. Um, this I like the best. Among those given Paxlovid and who were adequately vaccinated, in this study, they found a significant reduction in the primary outcome of decrease in the rate of severe COVID-19 or mortality, hazard ratio of 0.62. So about a 40, about a 38% reduction. Um, and this was also during the time of Omicron predominance. So sort of bringing Paxlovid and Omicron together. So let me ask you, Daniel, yep. is the difficulty in showing uh, prevention of severe disease or death with Paxlovid due to the fact that the vaccine is already preventing a good amount of that? I think that's the challenge. You're probably going to need a pretty big number, um, or you're just going to need to target that proper high-risk group. Because we talk about certain high-risk group, people over the age of 75, people with comorbidities. Um, so even if vaccinated, we know we're still seeing um, a chunk of those people end up in hospital and die. So you would need a, an adequate number. You also would need a high enough risk group to still see it. Um, because for a lot of us, I'm going to sort of put myself in that category, fingers crossed, um, being vaccinated, we're already in really good shape. All right, after Paxlovid, we have remdesivir, we have monoclonals, uh, now just bebtilovimab, and malnupiravir. And let's not do those harmful things, um, you know, and I think we know what some of those are, but finally, just off embargo, the article randomized trial of metformin, ivermectin, and fluvoxamine for COVID-19 finally published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, we'll have to put in the link because I put all this in prior to the embargo being raised, prior to there being a link the day that we're recording this for this article. Um, but this is going to be a bit of a surprise, Vince, and we're going to find out finally whether ivermectin really works for COVID. So these are the results of the COVID out trial. In this phase three double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial, the effectiveness of three repurposed drugs, metformin, ivermectin, and fluvoxamine were tested to prevent serious SARS-CoV-2 infection in non-hospitalized adults who had been enrolled within three days after a confirmed diagnosis of infection and less than seven days after the onset of symptoms. The patients were between the ages of 30 and 85 and all had either overweight or obesity. The primary composite endpoint was hypoxemia, less than 93% oxygen saturation on home oximetry, emergency department visit, hospitalization, or death. All analyses used controls who had undergone concurrent randomization and were adjusted for SARS-CoV-2 vaccination and receipt of other trial medications. So let's go through a little bit of the results because I know everyone's excited. This is finally the study that shows us a total of 1,431 patients underwent randomization of these Patients, 1,323 were included in the primary analysis, median age, 46, 56% were female, 6% six were, preg six were pregnant of those 56, 52% had been vaccinated, so sort of a split there. The adjusted odds ratio for primary event was 0 0.84, um, 1.05, 0 0.94, but let's go through. What were those different drugs? 0 0.84 with metformin, um, but with a wide confidence interval, p-value 0 0.19. For ivermectin, it was 1.05, p-value 0 0.78. For fluvoxamine, 0 0.94, confidence interval of 0 0.66 to 1.36, a p-value of 0 0.75. Um, they then go on, and I know there's some press releases where they're going to look at a pre-specified secondary analysis, but I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to go to where the authors go. The authors conclude that none, I know this is a shock, none of the three medications that were evaluated prevent the occurrence of hypoxemia an emergency department visit, hospitalization, or death associated with COVID-19. So just another study um, that did not show a benefit for ivermectin, did not show a benefit for fluvoxamine. All right. 
And if you end up in the hospital, that early inflammatory, lower respiratory hypoxic phase, steroids, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, maybe remdesivir if early enough, maybe further immune modulation if needed, avoid those unnecessary and unproven therapies. And we will move to the conclusion, the late phase. The article, readmissions, post-discharge mortality, and sustained recovery among patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19 was published in CID among adults hospitalized with COVID-19 in Eastern Denmark, all right, where they're building a sailboat, March 18, 2020 to January 12, 2021. They assessed all-cause mortality, recovery, and sustained recovery 90 days after admission and readmission and all-cause mortality 90 days after discharge. Recovery was defined as hospital discharge and sustained recovery alive without readmission for 14 consecutive days. And I will point out in this study, among the over 3,000 patients included of those discharged from hospital, 20% were readmitted and 10% died. So this is all cause though. It's not just COVID, right? That is true. And I think that's actually interesting um, because part of that is how much of that is directly COVID? How much of this is this immediate post-COVID? How much is just these are elderly, vulnerable individuals who are at higher risk to begin with? So um, and then I will say, as I always like to say, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, I want everyone to pause the recording right here. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. You can also go to Microbe.tv and on either site, click the Donate button. But if you go to the ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, we are now having our floating doctor's fundraiser. During the months of August, September, and October, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled by TWB up to a potential donation of $40,000. All right. It is time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Will writes, I realize you have addressed nearly every variation on the theme of should this patient get Evusheld? But my father-in-law is 83, had, had had a splenectomy eight years ago. We've been cautious in managing exposure. My father-in-law's current with with vaccination. There's a family memorial service this fall that my in-laws plan to attend because he has no spleen. He's inquired about Evusheld and his uh, PCP and local infusion clinic has been told that having esplenia is, but otherwise being in good health for his age does not qualify him for Evusheld unless an IgG test found that he had produced no antibodies. Because he demonstrated some antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, the clinic says he does not qualify. Physicians I've discussed this with, I'm in North Carolina, have universally said they'd recommend Evusheld for a patient like my father-in-law. What would you recommend? Yeah, you know, I just, I took my glasses off so I could, you know, smack myself in the head without hurting myself quite as much. Um, you know, I don't know why this medicine is sitting on so many shelves. Here's an incredibly effective medicine. Here's an individual who's moderately immune compromised. I'm not sure why you would not give this individual that extra benefit. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to move forward. And part of moving forward is using all the tools. Don't, don't leave the tools sitting there on the shelf. So in this, this is a situation where I would, um, I would be on the side of all the physicians who are encouraging the use of Ebushel to protect this individual. Anne writes, I've heard Daniel say a million times, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. So I was hoping Daniel would comment on this tweet from Shane Crotty. Quote, in my opinion, if you had COVID a month ago, then a booster is pointless and potentially disruptive to the ongoing antibody education the body is still doing. We know from multiple labs that the immune system is doing a brilliant job of improving antibodies for at least six months. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, Shane's a brilliant guy and, and I, and I understand where he's coming from when he makes that. I'll make a couple of comments. Um, you know, one of them is thinking about the different variants We're we're all sitting here in pretty much BA5. So if you just got BA5 and it's four weeks later, um, you could say, boy, I'm probably somewhat protected against BA5. This was probably a boost. I think Dr. Wolinsky sort of echoed something along these lines. Um, Prior in the pandemic, as we kept moving from variant to variant, we had multiple circulating, we would see someone get over one infection, and then four weeks later, boom, they'd hit another variant. And you know, then we didn't want to be the doc who told them to wait, and now they have COVID while they were waiting. Um, the other side of this, um, I think there's two more sides I'm going to hit, um, is the impact on long COVID. Unfortunately, we are seeing long COVID 
um, in people who get um, infected. And we have seen evidence that the sooner you get your vaccination after that. So if clearly if the person was unvaccinated, I would be encouraging them to start on a vaccine series. Um, and then really the last I'll touch on is we are pretty close to having these new updated bivalent vaccines, which may actually um, increase our protection for some period of time. Um, so yeah, we're in a little bit of a gray zone. So I know everyone would like a really simple, straight answer to this. Uh, so it'll really come down to the individual details. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's great to make sweeping and say, I can think of no reason, et cetera, et cetera. But each individual, you got to kind of look at the big picture and then make a decision. Stephen writes, I remember participating in a mass vaccination program for polio about 64 or 65. This was the Sabin OPV series. Each dose we were handed a cup with a sugar cube to suck on. I have no written record of this vaccination, but I dimly recall having received only two of the three doses. I was eight or nine years old. A year or so later, I was hospitalized for appendicitis. For a few days, I was moved to a ward next to a boy my age who was in an iron lung. This is an experience I will never forget. Most people have seen pictures of iron lungs. However, I doubt many of you have experienced one in operation. Iron lung machines in the 60s were big, noisy contraptions. My neighbor's iron lung made an incessant clunk-whoosh sound as the machine's valves and pumps worked to provide pressure changes to assist his breathing. He lay on his back with a mirror over his head at a 45-degree angle so he could look around the room. We talked for hours about stuff that 10-year-old boys talk about, but we never talked about the iron lung or how long he might have to stay in it. So I know what a terrifying disease polio was, and I will never resist getting necessary vaccinations so long as they have been proven safe. I'm 66 now, and here's my question. Do I need an IPV shot? Yes, yeah, so this is a great question, and we're actually we're getting a lot of questions like this. So thank you for putting this out there. Um, there's a lot of folks who are not sure; they don't remember. And if you're not protected, then you should get protected. So um, maybe this is one of the positive things that's coming out of this tragedy: is a lot of people are starting to say, "Boy, am I up to date with my vaccines?" Um, and not just polio. Talk to your talk to your doctor. Find out um, because if you miss something, uh, now's a great opportunity to be up to date with your vaccines. And Guy writes, can an individual receiving their first Genios shot subcutaneously receive the second intradermally, or should the entire series follow the same administration method? Now, we have clear guidance on this, which is great. So if you got your first one um, one way, you can go ahead. If you got subcutaneous that first time, you can go ahead and get intradermal for the second one. So no problems, and that's currently what's being recommended. That's TWIV, clinical update number 128. Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.